Okay. Good afternoon My, and good morning and good evening for those who are following us from the Americas and from Asia. My name is Filippo Munna. I am sales director for EMEA at Hexagon Agility Mobile Pipeline. And thanks for joining this session on mobile pipeline solutions for, uh, for biomethane. Uh, today, uh, I have the great, great pleasure and honor to have uh, with me uh, John Baldwin, CEO of CNG Services. I think John Baldwin is a recognized authority in the field of natural gas and biomethane, especially in UK. And then uh, connected online on Teams, uh, we have David Kilburn, co-founder and CEO of RevLNG. RevLNG is a leading company in the biomethane sector. And Johan Weidmann, uh, CEO of Process Control. Process Control is the leading company for turnkey solution for CNG and uh, CBG in Scandinavia. Uh, all these companies are partners to, uh, with uh, Hexagon Mobile Pipeline in several biomethane projects, and we'll see the details uh, later. So, uh, for starters, I thought I could throw some numbers couple of numbers actually, uh, 34 billion cubic meters per year is today's global production of biomethane. Uh, but actually, based on the available feedstock, the potential is 840 billion cubic meters of biomethane. As you can appreciate, the gap is huge. And uh, this is why we are here. We would like to show how uh, biomethane is one of the solutions to solve the current challenges to our uh, environmental and energy uh, crisis, and how mobile pipeline is an important, is a key piece uh, in this solution. Uh, we, uh, Hexagon Agility, are the market leader uh, in manufa designing manufacturing uh, of uh, type 4 full carbon pressure vessels and systems for gas storage and gas transportation. Today we'll focus more on gas transportation. And we feel that uh, given our position and our 60 years experience, whose heritage starts with the aerospace industry. And by the way, our cylinders were on the space shuttle in the, in the 80s, just to uh, give the idea. We uh, would like to be part of this solution. We would like to drive this energy transformation because our vision is uh, clean air everywhere and our values are integrity and drive where integrity always comes first. So, oops, I'm sorry. A uh, quick look at what Hexagon Agility is. Uh, we are a Norwegian company listed at the stock exchange market in Oslo. Uh, our major shareholder is Mitsui. Mitsui owns 25% uh, of uh, Hexagon Composite Asa, who uh, is the full owner of Hexagon Agility. Uh, we are market leader in the Americas, both in the transportation sector and gas distribution, over 70,000 trucks running on CNG use our systems, and we have deployed over 1,800 modules for gas transportation, actually the mobile pipeline we are talking about today, worldwide, from very cold Canada and Scandinavia down to very hot Latin America and uh, Southeast Asia. So let's start to talk about the topic we are here for, uh, biomethane. We, we saw it before, there is a huge gap between what we are doing today and what we could be doing. In fact, where, where do we find a feedstock to make this biomethane? Actually, as this slide sh shows quite clearly, today only, uh, today only 7 percent of feedstock is used to uh, supply biomethane. Whereas if it was fully utilized, if we hypothetically reach the 840 billion cubic meters of biomethanes per year, 24 percent of the biomethane would come from uh, animal manure. The gap is even bigger with agricultural waste, where today the biomethane supply potential is used at 3% only. And it could be that 59% of the biomethane ca would come from agricultural waste. Now, both sources are off the grid for obvious reasons. We are talking mainly about farms. And that's where uh, transportation plays a key role, especially transportation with uh, lightweight carbon fiber uh, product that allow to reduce dramatically operating costs. Even further, let's have a look at what's happening in Europe. Today, if we look at the energy mix, only 3% uh, 
uh, is due to biomethane and biogas together. Uh, we are talking about 22 billion uh, cubic meters of gas. But actually, the potential here is expressed in exajoule would be five exajoule, but uh, perhaps uh, it makes more sense to talk about uh, cubic meters. It would be 138 billion cubic meters of uh, uh, biomethane. Uh, in the previous session, we were talking about uh, Repower EU, right? And Repower EU demands 35 billion cubic meters of gas. Well, the availability will be for 138 billion. Uh, whether we can really achieve the target at this point, it looks like it's really already answered. Uh, we could reach 13% of the energy mix in Europe. Uh, and then, wh what's beautiful about biomethane? This is just an example. It's taken from uh, the heavy-duty industry. Uh, we are comparing data points related to a Mercedes-Benz 7.7 liter. And when the truck is run on uh, renewable natural gas, I will use renewable natural gas and biomethane interchangeably during this session, uh, we will be as carbon negative as 740 gram per kilometer. So actually, biomethane is the cleanest uh, source of energy today available. Now, how does mobile pipeline come into the picture? Well, it, it's very simple, you know. Suppose you have a farm and you are located 10 kilometers away from the grid and you, and you produce your biomethane and you want to inject it. You know, building a pipeline could cost you as much as 10 million euros. Where, and, and it would cost also in terms of time, because it takes time to build it. Uh, deploying a mobile pipeline takes perhaps between 8 to 10 months. It requires a compression station built at the uh, anaerobic digestion location. And then it requires trucks that transport gas in compressed form. And the beauty of lightweight cylinder is that this carbon fiber product can transport three times as much the amount of gas that could be transported with, with traditional steel products. And it requires an injection point at the point of use that could be a pipeline or, or an industry. And as you can see, the impact in terms of capex, in terms of timing, in terms of flexibility, uh, this solution can be deployed fast, but could also be redeployed, supposing the plan uh, changes. Now, today, uh, we will have uh, with us uh, honorable speakers who will talk about how we can use a mobile pipeline to take biomethane off the grid and transport it to industrial users. This would be mostly the, the, the focus on John Baldwin uh, during his presentation, because yes, you can inject biomethane in the grid and take it out at a different point thanks to a, a green gas certificate scheme. Uh, David Kilburn will be more focused on capturing stranded gas and injecting it into the grid. This is what mostly uh, Revel and G does in, uh, in North America. But then, you know, there are other types of applications. We, we could go as far as talking about pipeline to pipeline transportation or mobile refueling uh, transportation of gas. But then we will move to Jan Weidemann, who will give us a very special perspective, the perspective of Scandinavia where road limits are so flexible that process control is able to build lightweight modules that can serve up to three customers with one go. The picture on the top uh, right corner shows a customer of process control moving three containers with hexagon cylinders, serving three different customers uh, in one go. But now, before uh, we move to the next presentation, I would like to leave you with, uh, with three uh, key takeaways. So today, only 16% of the potential biomethane is produced. Repower EU demands more, and we have seen that uh, we can make it, because the, the, the gap today is much bigger than what Repower EU demands. And mobile pipeline solves the problem of moving gas, especially from uh, a stranded source, uh, to the grid. So thank you, and now I would leave the floor to, to David Kilburn, who is connecting from uh, uh, North America. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's David Kilborn. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of a company called RevLNG. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today and speaking about uh, mobile pipelines and how they deliver value. Uh, a quick agenda, we'll talk a little bit about uh, our company, just a quick background, and how those mobile then mobile pipeline applications can be used and talk about some of the fastest growing markets in the renewable natural gas biomethane space. Uh, our company is uh, headquartered up in north central Pennsylvania on the east coast of the United States. And we are an integrated liquefied natural gas, compressed natural gas, and renewable natural gas development and solutions provider. Uh, we move molecules in, in trucks. So we own and operate a large liquefied natural gas and compressed natural gas transportation fleet. We're specialists in LNG, CNG, and RNG project development, transportation, storage, and regas infrastructures. And over the last four to five years, we've become the leading developer of renewable natural gas projects from dairy feedstock in the United States. Uh, we're also very proud to have a joint venture with Berkshire Hathaway Energy in the Pivotal platform. Uh, this is our LNG liquefaction facilities. There's three facilities. One's located in the Marcellus in near Scranton, Pennsylvania. One is located in Birmingham, Alabama. And the newest facility is located in Jacksonville, Florida, that utilizes LNG as well as renewable LNG as a bunkering fuel for boats that go to the Caribbean for large ships. Um, our key company and our services, uh, we believe in natural gas. And whether it's in compressed form, whether it's in liquefied form, or whether it's in a renewable form, we believe in gas and we have the key services and expertise um, to provide that for our customers. And over the last few years in the United States, probably the largest driver of mobile energy uh, solutions and mobile pipelines has been due to the growth in the renewable natural gas biomethane space. Uh, landfills are the largest producers here of biomethane in the United States on a volumetric basis. However, agriculture such as swine and dairy have become a leading development candidate due to the low carbon intensity scores that we would typically see with this um, with this type of a fuel. In the United States, uh, the, um, the American government has an Ag Star program, which is a federal program. And according to them, there are roughly 8,000 possible locations to do agricultural based biomethane production in the United States from dairy and swine farms alone. Um, there's less than 250 of these facilities that are operating in the United States today. So there's a very large opportunity for growth in the coming years. And this business is really just in its infancy, infancy in the United States. Uh, the drivers of this business, um, without a doubt, uh, these are the three, in essence, if you're a developer or an owner of these projects, these are your three revenue sources in the United States. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard or LCFS market um, is think of it as a state by state program. Um, there are different states, but California is by far the lar largest and most popular in volume um, and gets the most attention because it's one of the biggest economies in the world just a, as a standalone. The EPA or Renewable Fuel Standard Program is nationwide um, and that is tied to the RINs program here in the United States. Both of these programs are credit generators in essence, your, your carbon intensity scores, your volumetric, allow you to generate credits and then sell them against a carbon ton price in the marketplace to earn revenue. And then the third point is obviously just your commodity, such as Henry Hub or the local index, which has gone up substantially in the last six months of the United States due to global energy prices. Uh, Henry Hub was roughly $3 in MMBTU uh, you know, for, for the vast majority of the last few years. It's now trading between seven and a half and nine dollars. So those are your three generators. Um, in the United States, the, the low carbon fuel standard, it's a game of credits and deficits. So if you're a big energy, if you're big oil, um, if you're a refiner, you have to, in essence, um, meet your ESG goals and the thresholds, the goals to get to carbon neutrality in 2025, 2030, 2040. You're in a game of deficits. So in essence, you need to be able to buy credits from the RNG developers and the owners of these projects that have these credits and they get traded back and forth. And that's really how this, this marketplace works in the United States. Um, the low carbon fuel standard market, again, it's a state by state case. Uh, in the United States, California, again, being the biggest opportunity out there 
Oregon also has an LCFS program. And the hope is that in the United States that that many more states across the country will start to adopt an LCFS like type of program and you'll see uh, uh, larger diversified markets for the renewable natural gas and it just won't be dependent on California. Now we believe New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, some of these states will be soon to follow what the success has been in California. Um, our company uh, at, at RevLNG, as I said, has become a leading developer uh, of renewable natural gas projects in the United States from dairy feedstock. We currently have 10 plants that are up and operating in a joint venture with Detroit Edison Biomass. Uh, we're currently building 12 projects this year with our partner South Jersey Industries, and we have roughly 250,000 cows under contract, which is about 45 farms that will build out over the next three years. If you want to see what a this is what an RNG project looks like, this is the location uh, that we have in Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, and those are four uh, above ground complete mixed digesters, or roughly a million and a half gallons each. Uh, we take that gas. Uh, you're basically 60 percent uh, uh, methane, 40 percent CO2. We clean it up in the white building in a gas processing cleanup system using membranes. And then here we need to, in essence, like many projects, you don't have the availability uh, to get transport or, or pipeline infrastructure. So we use mobile um, energy transportation to move that gas to the market. Um, the vast majority of projects in the United States have to be done by mobile energy. Uh, Hexagon Lincoln has been our partner uh, for all of these. We have a large fleet of trucks. Um, their safety, uh, their capacity, their scale, and their use ease of use as operators is really re the reason why we've chosen them as our OEM. Uh, and we have a large portion of these in our in our fleet today and expanding that with numerous on orders. Um, CNG, th there's always the, the conversation as a developer, what is a better way to do it? Is it, is it better to use a, a mobile energy pipeline or is it better to connect uh, infrastructure and pipe to the farm. Um, the challenges in the United States, because we're such a big geographic country, that you don't have access, um, affordable access to natural gas pipeline infrastructure at the vast majority of these agricultural farms. So really mobile energy solutions has really become the the uh, mobile pipelines has really become um, the 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 go to choice, if you will, for all of these projects. And they work very well. Um, this is a picture of our terminal uh, in Wisconsin on the top. It's an aerial view. Um, and what that is, is you can see that we have a gas. This is a multi-use facility. We actually have three farms that are pipelined raw biogas into this facility that we clean up. We also unload seven different farms here uh, using hexagon trailers. Uh, and then we put the gas into an interstate pipeline at about 1,200 pounds. Um, so this facility, uh, you can scale these in the United States. It's really a function of how much, um, how much uh, uh, capacity, takeaway capacity that your pipeline can provide. Um, by, but by utilizing tube trailers, uh, it works extremely well. We're typically uh, bringing in a load here. Uh, some of our farms produce a load uh, of gas every every 10 to 12 hours. Uh, we run those 24-7, 365, and we can produce a substantial amount of natural gas into these terminals. So you get economies of scale. They become very efficient to be able to use. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and thank you for showing how the incentive schemes work in North America and how uh, you have developed your project. I think we uh, timing is essential here, so we move to Jon Weidemann, a CEO of Process Control. Hello, everybody. Um, today I will be joining you from Gothenburg, west side of Sweden. Uh, I'll try to give you a picture of a little bit about the, the unique development that we have done in the Nordic region, far away from everybody else. We have to find our own way. And Hexagon has been a partner for us for more than 15 years. So when no one is listening and challenging, we are at least saying that we are the Nordic region's leading supplier uh, for infrastructure for energy gases. Uh, this is our uh, home ground and footprint. So based on the west coast of Sweden, you can see we have done a lot of installations, more than 200 different kind of fueling stations and 300 mobile storages we have delivered uh, over the past 25 years. 
So it's uh, public stations, bus stations, we have filling stations, LCNG stations with a combination of liquid and compressed gas. We have then uh, stranded uses where we are doing decompression, and then we do all the development and a lot of other automation work and solution for energy storage and handling. So this is a typical station, and on the left you see the mobile storage container that we will focus on today. So uh, our stations are either fed by the grid or by a container. Then we compress it, store it, ready to use. We have then dispenser and you can refuel a car. We have the bus depot. It's the same. It's a little bit bigger compressor station. We have a, a larger scale gas storage. And as you can see in the middle here, we have for this station an LNG backup. If there for some reason is a disturbance on the net, we can back up with LNG. Uh, the buses in this case, we have slow filling. So during the night when no one is, is using the buses, we can fill them uh, very slow. We have also some fast filling stations where we can refuel a bus in under two minutes with a huge compressor station. In this case, we have uh, biomethane production. So on the left in the gray building, there's a compressor station, and then we refuel, refill the mobile storages. And as you can see here, we have several different models from several di different customers. And I think that's one of the, the big benefits about the mobility, that over lifetime, when you have uh, different contractors for driving the buses, supplying the gas to different locations, you can actually, you can say, reroute the pipeline by using the mobile storages. On the L LNG and LCNG, we have a market that is, is currently evolving. Uh, while the, there is a pickup of the use of LNG transports, we have a lot of boil off of the gas. And then by combining the two, we can actually uh, reduce the operating cost for the, the LNG operator by uh, compressing the gas uh, in, instead of cooling it a lot. Um, for standard <coughs> uses, we have a decompression unit. This is also developed internally with our own heat, heat exchangers. So there we can reduce the pressure of the gas from 250 bar to around two to four bars while heating it during the decompression. Um, the mobile storages, we, have, we are building them both with steel cylinders. If there is a, how can you say, a short distance between the, the points in which the gas is, is produced and used. And then uh, we have an equation where we calculate the, the, the distance needed in order to make the hexagon cylinders uh, profitable. And for us, it's about 50-50 over the years of the 300 we have delivered. Um, with this, these special four axle trucks, we can carry quite heavy load, so we can move almost four tons of gas in, in one go. Um, the situation in Sweden is that we have recently received governmental support for the production and also for the liquefaction. Um, totally, we have 66 production sites that has been subsidized, and you can see 22 of them was during the last year. So there is a big, big, big change um, in, in which our society is moving. The total consumption and production in Sweden, it's 15 terawatt of methane, whereof four terawatt is biomethane. Uh, but we do have biomass available to produce nine times more biomethane in Sweden. So I think our situation is more or less the same uh, like any other place that, uh, in the world. So uh, in Sweden, we have a limited gas grid. Uh, we have about 250 public uh, filling stations, and there is only a minority of those that are connected to the national gas grid. Uh, here you see in black where the gas grid is currently is available. So for this, we have created a, a, a unique need, you can say for off-grid solutions, um, and that has been solved with these mobile storages. 
what you can see also is that the, the gas grid is heavily regulated and uh, it's mostly suitable for industrial gas users that has the same consumption every day. So if you're running uh, Monday to Sunday evening uh, with more or less the same load, it works pretty good. But if you want to need to use some gas Tuesday and Thursday, regardless, you have to pay for a seven day use um, on your connection. Or more flexible and it's more adaptable to the volatile use and demand. Uh, we can get the biomethane straight from the biogas plant, don't have to pass the grid. Um, I will take you also through a customer case. That's where we have built, um, so we can house five mobile storages. It's a backup solution for a refinery where we have built a decompression unit that is on a two second standby uh, every second uh, during the year. So we can decompress uh, 4,000 kilos of gas per hour from 250 bar to 37 bar. There is no uh, gas grid nearby, so we need to transport it. And as far as the consumption pattern is, it's not possible to plan because sometimes it's used only a few times per year, but the cost for the refinery, uh, if they run out of energy and can't deliver it, is, is uh, I think the yearly cost is three times higher than the investment for this uh, solution. So the containers is of both the transport and also the, the local storage need. So this decompression unit is built inside a 40 foot container, where on the left side, we have a gas boiler that will uh, then use the biomethane to heat itself. On the right hand side, we have custom made heat exchangers that will heat the gas while uh, decompressing it. And here are some pictures from the performance check where you can yet again see different variants of mobile storages. And in the middle, there is a huge flare trying to simulate the 4000 kilo per hours uh, capacity. Or if you want to know a little bit more about us, please don't be shy and visit our homepage. So that was my message for today. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Scandi. Scandinavia is the home of Hexagon, and it's also a great field for mobile pipeline application due to the large territory and the spread of the population. Now we conclude our speaker session with uh, John Baldwin, CEO of uh, CNG Services. Thank you, John. Thank you. I can't remember what I'm saying, actually, so I need to have a look at my slides. Uh, we're, not, we're not like Sweden. We have a gas grid in the UK. Nearly everyone's on that. And we're not like, we're obviously not like the US because uh, shale gas is banned here, so it's not like the Marcellus. But we, we'll, we're going to talk about a, uh, a project we did in Scotland, which is to take gas out of the high pressure grid to some distilleries uh, who would never ever be on gas because of their location. So this is CNG services. We mostly work in biomethane, so we occasionally do virtual pipelines like this one. And there's quite a bit of activity at the moment in the UK sort of stranded or isolated uh, biomethane, which we'll touch on later. But we, we mostly work on biomethane into the gas grid, because obviously we are in the UK, it's a small country, the gas grid is pretty much everywhere. Uh, this is a project we did in Scotland in 2000 and sort of 19, 20. It started off in 2013. Uh, the idea was that there was, a, there was an onshore oil field at Leibster in the north, northeast, of, top, northeast of Scotland, and it was flaring gas. And the obvious thing to do was to stop flaring it, capture it, take it to the distillery. Uh, but the, the problem we have, if you've, got, if you've got one well, you can't sell that gas to a distillery because it's not going to be reliable. When the gas runs out, the distillery would say, well, what am I doing now? So we realized that we needed to get a reliable source of gas. So we found a reliable source of gas on the sort of 85 bar gas grid near Aberdeen. So we, we built with, and it, this was, became an early keyed project. So we built a, uh, a compressor station on the 85 bar grid near Aberdeen. And then we take the gas from that, or early Queed does, by hexagon trailers to these four distilleries. And as I say, these are distilleries that wanted to get off oil wanted to get on biomethane, and the way to do that is to get gas out of the grid and then do a deal with early keyed 
on certificates because early creed have got a lot of uh, biomethane from, from food waste plants. So the gas goes into the grid in, in the UK, in England, but the certificate comes out of the high pressure gas grid. So this was the site where we found a high pressure gas grid. So there's five pipelines going from St. Fergus full of 85 bar gas. We, we tapped into the grid. Uh, we, we built a compressor station, which the way I describe it, it's a bit like if, you, if you're climbing Everest, you, you really don't want to start at the bottom. You want to start at sort of 25,000 feet. So when we work on CNG, now my, our sister company, CNG Fuels, you're trying to find the transmission grid because you're basically lazy. And you, you don't want to start at 200 millibar. You want to start at a transmission grid pressure. So we did this, and we, we think this is the highest capacity filling station in the UK because each of the compressors does about 7,000 in Europe, 7,000 meter cubed an hour. So we've got two of those, which gives you a lot of gas. Uh, and then we need, obviously, to get the gas to the customer. And what you realize when you're talking to the distilleries, they do not like gas by road, really. They like gas by pipeline. But if there's no pipeline for 100 miles, they, they will put up with gas by road, but they don't really like it. But given that they're having it, they don't want many deliveries. So we realized that if, if you had a steel trailer, you, you could carry about four tons of gas. And if you had a a, a, a composite, it was about 10 tons of gas and deliver about 9 tons. So it's a sort of obvious point, really. So the, you, you can't really, we couldn't do what we do in Scotland with steel because the distilleries would not have put up with the road movements. It's quite an important point. So the project was only facilitated by developments in Type 4 technology. So there's a bit of detail on here, but basically we put, we put the gas into the trailer. Uh, there's five loading bays here. There's, as I said, the four distillery sites. And, 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 and I think that's fine. And then at the distillery end, uh, we have a pressure reduction unit. So we take the gas at 250 bar and we cut it to two bar. I think this particular one is Glen Morangi. And again, what I said before is they don't really like CNG. They want it on a pipe, but there's no grid. So what we did here is we, we decant the CNG half a mile away and that's, that's the decanting station. And then we run a two-bar pipe into the distillery. So as far as the distillery concerned and the visitors, it is on the gas grid. And that's quite a good model. So when we're looking at hydrogen jobs, there is no way you'll bring hydrogen into a distillery. You'll fall foul of all sorts of issues. So you'll probably have to do the same. So the hydrogen probably has to finish up outside of places and be piped in below ground in a low-pressure gas pipe like this. Uh, we did some other distilleries besides Glenmorangie, uh, Kleinleash, Dalwini, Rose Isle. And, and it, 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 it's, all it's all fine. I think if I go back now to that, that site I mentioned in 2012 13, Leibster, we never did that. That, that gas was never, was never been able to capture, and it's not been produced for sort of 10 years. They're looking at bringing it back now, oil prices are high. But when we bring it back, we can capture that CNG now and know we've got places to take it. We don't need trailers. Early Quid have got trailers. They don't need customers. They've got customers. So what was a Herculean project in 2012-13, because we didn't have anything, you, all you're doing is replacing the mother station. So instead of it coming out of the transmission grid, it's just flare gas. So it, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of relatively easy to envisage that, that happening now. Uh, just one other thing which is worth, worth mentioning is that it's quite a busy slide, but basically there's about 100 biomethane projects in Great Britain and about 90-something of them, 95 of them, did, they just put the gas into the low-pressure gas grid or the tr uh, uh, up, to, up to a 40-bar gas grid. And that's obviously a good idea if you've got your feedstock near where you've got the gas grid. But there's a few now who, 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 who take it to somewhere else. And I think there's about seven projects b built or under development where you can move the gas by road. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's quite, it's not as good as if you could put it in the grid, but, but, but it is okay. And I think it gives you, it also gives you a little bit of optionality because vehicles that exist now that run on biomethane, and if your biomethane's from waste, then in addition to taking it to put it in the grid somewhere, you can also run all your vehicles on it. And that's quite... That's quite lucrative in the UK regime. So there's quite a bit of activity going on. Uh, ne it'll never be like Sweden because we have a gas grid, so it's not a Scandinavian model. But there is opportunities in, in the UK with stranded feedstock, which is nowhere near the gas grid. You can't really move feedstock. So planning permission, feedstock, 
move the gas by road, inject it in one of these places. Thank you, John. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is the perspective of serving customers off the grid by taking gas from, uh, from the pipeline. <coughs> I'm sorry. So now uh, we can start the, I'm sorry, the Q&A session. For those who are connected online, uh, you can use the messenger on the right side of your screen and you can type your question and then they will be taken to the speakers. Otherwise, if anyone on the floor wants to ask a question, we are happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I have a question about uh, Repower Europe. So um, with all the coverage around Repower Europe, how does the uh, mobile pipeline help meet the 2030 target of um, 35 BCM? Uh, biomethane, and also uh, how do we get there, and how quickly can we get uh, there? Okay. So this is my question about mobile I, pipeline. If it's okay for John, this could be a question that John can help to answer, otherwise I, I can take it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to, to, to develop biomethane, you need three things. You need a feedstock, you need to be able to get planning permission, and you need to, you need to be able to get a revenue. So putting it into the gas grid gives you a revenue, moving it by road gives you a revenue, putting it remotely into the grid or off of vehicle fuel. So the economics work, and I think, I think there, there's probably also a realisation that it is deliverable today. So if you want to decarbonise your fleet of trucks, you can do it tomorrow. You're not waiting 10 years for some other technology. Sure. Thank you, John. And, and as we have seen, we have availability to make up to 138 billion cubic metres. So definitely, definitely there's a space. I would, I would like to understand what are the losses uh, compared to all these three different technologies, CNG, LNG, uh, when it comes to fueling your vehicle or uh, end consumer using this gas. Uh, in terms of pricing or losses, how, how does it work technically? Well, uh, let, I can answer for what percent pertains uh, CNG. Partly uh, today, uh, the, the schemes that are, uh, appear under the uh, Red 2 uh, directive in the European Union and the, also the policies uh, in place in the United States enforced by the carbon in uh, California and also uh, by the EPA directly from the US government provides incentives uh, for uh, and, and calculate the carbon negativity of the biomethane. So the more the biomethane is carbon negative, the more the user will benefit because he will decrease, and I'm talking about mainly fleet owner, he will def decrease the uh, carbon footprint of its fleet. So the key is recognizing the uh, carbon negativity uh, of biomethane, and that's where you definitely don't fall into a loss, actually. Uh, it's, uh, I, I understand that s uh, under the LCF uh, scheme in, in California, uh, biomethane is sold up to 200 US dollars per MMBTU. So it can go as high as that. And one point needs to be clear, uh, the carbon negativity of biomethane depends on the feedstock, depends on where you make the biomethane. If you are far away from the grid or if you are closer. So it's never one number, but it, it has to be calculated, it has to be assessed. Uh, there was another question thank from the, yes. Uh, thank you, Duncan Valentine, thank you. Philippe, a very simple question, really. Um, obviously, these plants are very high capex. Obviously, these, uh, these trucks ha have a cost. Um, does uh, Hexagon have any financial support? And have you any examples of that? Sure. Thank you for the question because uh, this, is a, uh, this is a key aspect uh, when we offer uh, turnkey solutions. We, we are a Norwegian company, but we have production bases in Germany and in the United States. In the United States that this gives us access to export credit agencies of these countries. And today this is what we are doing. So basically we kill the 
CapEx problem by uh, providing very attractive financing uh, for this kind of project, not only biomethane, also uh, other type of projects, but uh, yes, we at, at the, still today at the current uh, interest rates, we can be extremely attractive, yes. Thank you. A question for Johan. My name is Peter Waters. I work in Ireland. Thank you. Uh, John. Um, there's uh, five sites in Ireland at the moment with uh, biomethane generation, and there's one bio LNG. There's about 30, and of which 15 are hexagon um, moving around. Um, Sweden and, and Scandinavia is probably about 10 years ahead of us. Jo Johan, are there any key takeaways or learning points for us? Um, coming down the pipeline. So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. I think one issue is that you have to be proud when you do something that is good. Uh, we heard earlier that the, the uh, distilleries was not so happy to use CNG. I mean, on the containers in Sweden, there is a lot of great, great advertisement of the good thing being done when you move around. So that is one. Second of all, make it simple. You need to have a, a national legislation for all the approval, make a standard, take the hexagon bottles, make sure that everybody uses the same, then it goes really fast. Uh, make sure that you have a whole system where, where both production, distribution and consumption is, is, let's say, taken care of by the government. So you have a good financial support all around that. Um, and then talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. I think that's what we have been doing. People start to recognize the, the biomethane now after 25 years. Take some time. Thank you, Johan. Any other question from the floor? Uh, Nicolas Piot from Storingy. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, social acceptability, because we know that uh, around a lot of projects for biomethane, there is a lot of problems with uh, stakeholder management, especially with running trucks for feedstocks and digestates. How do you cope with that, with putting some extra trucks actually around the project? Thank you for your question. I think uh, here David Kilburn can help uh, with, uh, with an answer. Yeah, happy to. So um, the, the, the volume of trucks that are utilized in these projects is extremely small. And what I mean by that is uh, like a, a typical, if we have a, a 7,000 head farm, a 7,000 cow head farm, which is, which is a big farm in the United States, right? You're basically making one uh, tanker load on average every 18 hours. So one and a quarter trips a day. Um, in the United States, that's very, very low um, traffic. So th there is, you know, sometimes, and I agree with you, like when you first come in, one of the first questions the community will ask, well, how many trucks are going to be on the road? And does that noise and does that, you know, safety factor come into it? But I think if you, if you advocate and you educate the community of what you're doing, that, hey, a lot of our projects would typically have at least two tankers. A, a, a 7,000 farm would probably have three tankers in rotation. That tanker is really only only making, you know, if there's three tankers, only one that one every three days, so to speak, right? So one tanker a day, give or take. So it's a pretty small um, amount. And so it's been fairly, once you educate them, it has been fairly easy to get past um, that question. But that is a question that constantly comes up. And I would add to that, that uh, now more and more uh, ADR transport is run on gas, on biomethane, so that also helps to answer. Yes, thank you. Any other? Thank you. Yeah, hi, I, a question about the sort of incentive punitive programs that are in play. The California one is the LCFS, is that correct? Correct, yes. And I think we have the RTFO here in the UK. Are those, are those is that model uh, propagating across the world? Are we seeing more and more of those? Is that sort of uh, incentive punitive scheme the, the sort of um, standard model across different countries for um, permeating and promoting, uh, the, you know, the biogas model for transport? So I can...
provide my perspective, then perhaps we can, we can again hear a bit from, uh, from David Kilburn. Uh, he knows uh, very well what the schemes are in place in the US. I, I would say that with the new directive in Europe, we are going towards the same, uh, same direction. So that, that, is, that is the idea. Uh, we, we calculate the carbon negativity and then certificate can be traded based on that. But uh, on top of this, I think companies have their own policies and more and more we uh, see companies setting targets for themselves. Even in countries where there are no policies in place, they want to be able to declare that they are uh, close to a carbon zero emission. And that's where you can again you know, trade uh, certificates. Yes. Uh, perhaps David can add something to? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. You know, I, I'm not sure so much on a worldwide basis how it, it, I think that those programs and platforms are, are being enacted um, by the policymakers. Um, there is absolutely a drive, and, and in the United States over the last 24 to 36 months, you know, voluntary ESG programs by Fortune 500 companies or, or by communities are really starting to take hold where you didn't see that five years ago. Um, the LCFS program, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, um, it, that, that credits and deficits type of program, certainly is, is the biggest one is California. But if you remember that slide I showed it going east, um, there's there's really one or two states in, in America that have adopted it. But I do think uh, in the United States, all 50 you know, all 50 states probably a decade from now will have an enacted that. And I think that type of a pattern probably holds um, well throughout the rest of the world where other companies, other countries, certainly European countries, uh, Western countries will start to adapt a program like that uh, for ESG mandates. Okay, thank you. So if no other question from the floor, I would like to close with uh, one question coming uh, from me uh, to, to the other speakers, but mainly uh, I would say John and, uh, and Johan. Now, back to the Repower EU program, uh, we see that the potential can be, uh, the, the demand can be, can be satisfied since the potential is big. But based on your experience, you know, uh, what are the challenges ahead that, that uh, we, we can face? Perhaps, John, you can, you can add something to well, that? I think, I think in, in Great Britain, obviously, the main challenge is getting a revenue stream. So at the moment, if you get a revenue for biogas making electricity, you, you, it's not made easy for you to get it for putting gas into the gas grid. So that's one area that's being looked at. Uh, so it really is, you know, can you, can you get a revenue? But I think if, if over like, the next 10 years, as we're going to have such a lot of renewable electricity in Europe, you shouldn't really be burning biogas in 2030, really. And if, you, and if you're making biomethane, you should always be capturing the CO2, which is another revenue. So I think if you look at a slide of the sort of carbon negativeness of, of manure biomethane, if, once you're capturing the CO2 and locking it away, it becomes very much more negative. And I think that negativeness has a significant value to industrial customers who have got carbon emissions they cannot get rid of because their factories are natural gas. So I think, I think over the years, biomethane, biogas becomes biomethane. It goes somewhere into the grid or whatever, via road or directly into the grid. But we always have to capture the CO2. We never vent the CO2. And I, I think that new injection of revenue stream for the next 10 years is quite, is quite important for this market, in, certainly in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Johan, you want to comment? a little bit earlier about the, the the capex and yes there is a large capex but there is also a very very long lifetime of the investments that you make so i think to to really uh, facilitate um, the gut to make investments in this business we we need our key stakeholders um, to make long-term commitments about the support that they're going to give for biomethane i think that will be extremely important I think also it's very important that we, we get good support by our researching community to find good applications because today everybody is fighting about what is the right thing. Is it electricity? Is it biomethane? But when you remove diesel uh, and gasoline off the chart for fueling vehicles, there is not so much left. And we can see in Scandinavia now that LNG powered trucks and buses, but mainly trucks, they, 
that system works extremely well. Quiet. <coughs> they can run 1,000 kilometers on one refueling. There is a quite big network now. So having different uh, uh, applications, both CNG and LNG, you have it for vehicles. You can also have it for applications where you need a lot of energy instantly, like the customer case we had with a backup for a refinery. So I think that will be uh, facilitating uh, the implementation of biomethane. But also the RED2, the new director on how to actually capture the negative CO2 uh, that uh, occurs when you uh, are producing biomethane from manure and waste. I think that is very important to make people understand uh, the benefits of biomethane. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for, uh, for attending this session. And if you have more questions, then I'm, I'll be here today and also tomorrow. Thank you very much.